Erev Tov Chavri, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, and the stage is clearly being set over in the Far East with North Korea. Not only is the stage being set with North Korea, but even in the Middle East, the actions that are happening all around Israel. The stage for biblical prophecy is at an unprecedented level, and I, and. I don't even know where really to begin, how to bring this out to you, and I cannot uh, encourage you enough to really look carefully at the things that I want to share with you tonight. Share this with your friends, with your family members. I encourage people to be in prayer, and if you do not know that Jesus Christ is your Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, I know that's, that's almost seems crazy to say on a news broadcast, but friends, I feel like it's that serious of an issue that we're looking at from a biblical perspective here tonight. I do encourage you to really, uh, you know, seek the Lord with all of your heart. My Jewish brothers and sisters that are listening, I encourage you as well. I'll be speaking to you more directly here in the coming days about prophetic insights that we have overlooked as a Jewish people that I really think is important for you to be looking at as well. Uh, let me get right into the broadcast today. Uh, RT has bring actually not even let's say January yeah January fifteenth today, uh, RT reporting here U S Canada hosts World Summit on North Korea but Russia and China will only be briefed on the results. Now I saw this just yesterday where there was talk about that China would not be present and they were saying how that China is a major player. Some of the people were reporting, some of the news outlets reporting about this, China being the major player for when it comes to North Korea and that they're not going to be present. It was appearing as if China didn't want to come, but now we're seeing a different story altogether. Let me share with you what's being said here. Canada and the U.S. are hosting a meeting on North Korean Peninsula deadlock, gathering diplomats from 20 nations. Moscow and Beijing, however, are not invited and will only be briefed on the outcome. Russia's foreign minister, Lavrov, has actually been stated. The meeting held January 15th through the 17th seeks to achieve the goal of secure prosperous and denuclearization, denuclearized Korean Peninsula, according to its organizers. The Vancouver group of foreign ministers from across the globe will meet to demonstrate solidarity and opposition to North Korea's dangerous illegal actions, reads the statement on the event issued by the Canadian government. All right, now we'll go into reading all of this here, but it speaks about 18 countries in Vancouver group. Uh, besides the U.S. and Canada, including Denmark, Greece, Norway, New Zealand, and others, the two major players, China and Russia, who are immediately immediate neighbors of North Korea, are definitely not keen on the prospect of nuclear conflict on their borders. Okay, now very troubling situation. Not only is it troubling there, but we also see that the United States, uh, this just coming out here a little bit earlier today, aircraft spots U.S. Air Force B-52H Stratofortress Strat Strat bombers, call sign, gives you the call signs of the flights there, departed Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana and route to Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. What are all these bombers in this, headed in this direction there if they're not getting ready for a military action and all they're doing is galvanizing their partners there to go against uh, North Korea. Now, granted, you have to understand, friends, I realize North Korea is clearly a threat to the United States of America. And so my, I, I can't begin to stress how concerned I am uh, for the safety of the United States and as well for the position that this puts President Trump in. But I think it's much bigger than that. As I mentioned to you not long ago, you know, Jesus says in Matthew 24, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see you to be not troubled. Now he tells you, don't be troubled about it, about the rumors of wars. Okay? Let's take a look here in Daniel 11, as I mentioned to you in verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall affrighten him. That's the king of the north, the him there. And he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to take away 
are, are, to, are to, yeah, take away many. King James says, make away many. In other words, he's killing them off, right? Now, the word here is from the Hebrew word shema, which is to hear, but it's in the plural, ushamot, which and hears, okay, and hears of these tidings that uh, frighten him, the king of the north, he's hearing things, and it can also be translated, even according to Strong's Concordance here, as rumors, because it's something you're hearing, but you're not really sure what you're hearing, so it could be also translated as the word rumors. I can't help but think that it's connected to the passage of Matthew 24. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now Jesus says, be ye not troubled. Yeshua making the statement, be ye not troubled. Now, the reason why I believe he says that, because it's not North Korea, per se, here, but it's China and Russia. And I think because Yeshua knew full well, that's Jesus, he knew full well that China and Russia are not going to attack the United States or any of the other NATO partners as a result of the rumors that are going on. All right. So the rumors, though, friends, let me explain to you what the rumors are. The rumors, though, it has nothing to do with North Korea. I really don't think that North Korea is just going to take and lob a bomb towards the United States. Under heavy provocation, yes, maybe he would. Maybe he will just have enough and, and pull the trigger. I don't say that he won't. And I realize that's a threat to the United States, and it's a threat that has to be taken seriously. But when it speaks about the rumors of war, the rumor is the fact that they're worried about China and Russia getting involved in this. And as a result, the king of the north doesn't take heed. He goes ahead and kills many. Now, is that many just going to be limited to the, to the fight in North Korea? Or is it going to go much broader? Because China and Russia may get involved in the war if North Korea is attacked. And then again, they may not. I have no idea. But the, you have to realize, too, we're also looking at prophecy here that if you back up to, say, verse 40, well, we're going to get into that in a moment. Let me just kind of stay where we're at here on verse 44. Let me, let me kind of move a little bit ahead, and then I'll come back to verse 44 here. Another article that just came out, and this here was on the Jerusalem Post. This article comes out, Hawaii and Israel. And Israel and the Jerusalem Post was comparing this false alarm in Hawaii to that of what the Israelis go through on a regular basis. Now, the article does stress that the Israelis do, are not going under the threat of a nuclear attack. But the continual threat of rockets coming in from Gaza, that of uh, possible rockets coming in from Hezbollah to the north, and of course with Israel steadily getting involved with Syria, there's no doubt fear that rockets could come in from Syria. But as the article notes in here, it's in no comparison to what the people in Hawaii went through because they don't have nuclear bomb shelters in Hawaii. But yet they had an alarm going off that a nuclear ICBM was headed their direction. For a half an hour, people getting warnings on their cell phones, a nuclear ICBM is headed in their direction. The panic that it caused for these people here. I can tell you firsthand in Israel, that's not the type of panic we go through. Yes, I have it on my phone in Israel. Every time we have a rocket go in our direction, you know, the, 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 the siren goes off and it tells you where it's headed to. But even when I'm there in Israel and we're getting these types of alerts, you'd be, you'd be amazed. The average citizen hardly does nothing about it. I've been there many times when the sirens go off, the, the, the bomb sirens go off. Ah, you look out your window to see if anything's coming and people normally just take it for granted. Why? Because it's so constant of a, of a situation in Israel. And we're not dealing with mass destruction, but at the same time, as the article points out, Israel's concerned about Iran getting a hold of a nuclear bomb, and of course that becoming a true reality for the Israeli people. Now that's what the article is speaking about. 
And it is troubling. And it's more troubling because of why. We are seeing biblical prophecy being fulfilled in the Middle East. And that's where we back up to verse 40. And at that time of the end shall the king of the south, he doesn't push at him. He pushes with him. Emo, with him. That's with who? With the king of the north. And the king of the north shall come not against him. Aliyah, Melechatzephon, Belchit. Okay, and the king of the north, he comes over him with what with chariots and with the horsemen what is this what is this to do what and he comes where uba barzot to the countries right and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow as he passes through this was clearly a biblical prophecy about an Israeli leader working with the king of the north to overthrow the entire Middle East. It's exactly what's happening. So we do have a constant threat in Israel. You know, it reminds me of Micah. Here, this is interesting. You know, I, I brought this prophecy out long ago. We begin to see the Syrian war unfold because it's written right in the Bible in Micah chapter 7. There shall be a day when they shall come unto you from Assyria, even to the cities of Egypt, and from Egypt, even to the river, and from sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. Who? Coming at who? Israel. An attack. An invasion. And the land, what land? Assyria, shall be desolate for them that dwell therein because of the fruit of their doings. Or maybe that land could be speaking about Israel. But clearly we do see a fulfillment in Assyria. The land has totally become desolate. Refugees all over the world. And because of what? Their own doing. And according to, when we look at the prophecy about Damascus being fallen in the ruinous heat, God puts the blame on Israel for not being mindful of the rock of her salvation. Now that, let me tell you something when it says Israel there. All right, let me just quickly, we'll just quickly jump into that real fast. I think it's important to look at this. If you take a look at Isaiah 17, and we see that Damascus becomes a ruinous heap, all right? And as you go down, and the fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus, that's being the house of Israel, because they are, the house of Israel had accepted Yeshua as the Messiah, while they were in captivity living in Syria, and they many of them remain there. Now we know that Ephraim also uh, went dispersed throughout the land. He becomes part of the British Empire, and as a prophecy about Ephraim's descendant, he becomes over many nations, and that, was the, that includes the United States, Australia, uh, New Zealand, places like that, all right? Now, but then he says here, and the remnant of Aram, or Syria, shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And it shall come to pass as the day that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. As you move down, though, and when God speaks about um, what has caused this, in that day shall the cities be as forsaken places, and a little further down, uh, yeah, this, this is it, in that day shall the strong cities shall be as a forsaken places, which were forsaken from before the children of Israel, after the manner of woods and lofty forests, and it shall be a desolation. Where? Syria. All right? Now, here's what's interesting. In that day shall his strong cities be as the forsaken places, which were forsaken from before the children of Israel. That's not just the house of Judah, friends. You can't put the blame just on the modern state of Israel alone for what happens there in Syria and throughout the entire Middle East. That's, by the way, I said entire Middle East because it's Assyria. The, the country of Assyria in biblical times included also North Iraq, where Nineveh is. All right? Mosul. And this is what's been going on. The total destruction of all of ancient Assyria. But it's not just the house of Judah, who's in modern Israel today, but he puts this to the children of Israel. The British Empire, the United States. They're also complicit because why? 
The children of Israel have been dispersed. The European nations also that have come against the Middle East for the same purpose. And what does he say? For you have forgotten the God of thy salvation. And I can't help but wonder if this is not more on the house of Israel than it is on the house of Judah. You know why? Because as Christian people, you know that the rock of your salvation is Christ Jesus. And instead of us truly acting the way Christ acts, we have gone in there and we have allowed a country that was a fortress for our brothers. Yeah, under President Bashar al-Assad, who has been very supportive of the Christian community, even though he's a Shiite. Didn't know that, did you? Supportive of the Christian community, a fortress to Ephraim. And when Damascus falls, so does that fortress for Ephraim. Because why? We are not mindful of the rock of our salvation. Now let me tell you something. I don't care who's out there that claims to be Israeli that are sitting there cheering on the murder of the, of the Syrian people. That's demonic. You know why it's demonic? Because you don't know the Word of God. You know? It says in Revelation, as I brought that message, it's an old message, but I brought it out for a reason. If the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. And you know why it says that in the scripture? Because in Revelation and Laodicea, it says you're blind, miserable, wretched, naked, and you don't even know it. Israel today, and I don't say, I'm not talking about the house of Israel, but the house of Judah, they are blind. They're still blind to the recognition of who Yeshua is, who the Mashiach truly is in this day. They are blind. But they're not willfully blind. They're blind because why? God blinded their eyes so that they would offer him up as the sacrifice. They would judge him according to the prophecies that Moses gave. When God said, and that's the whole thing about the rock. God said to Moses, take the elders of Israel with you and go up there and let them judge the rock. And you smite the rock with your rod that it bring forth its waters. That was prophetic speaking of the house of Judah that they would do this. And that's why they're blind. Paul even says it over in Romans chapter 11. They are enemies for your sake. They are beloved of the Father's sake. And they would be blind until that deliverer comes out of Zion. All right? Now the whole thing is, but yet the scripture in Laodicea, speaking of the Christians in the last days here of Laodicea, the modern church of today, who are predominantly of the house of Israel, the descendants of the ten so-called lost tribes of Israel, you are blind, miserable, naked, and don't even know it. And so when the word of God says, if the blind, Jesus says, if the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. No wonder why he's got to send two witnesses to wake you up. It's not, just, it's not just the house of Judah that needs to be woke up. It's also the house of Israel that needs to be woke up too. You know, and I love you. God loves you as well. I'm not saying this to be, to be hard on you. You know, you have to understand. God says it right here. For thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and thou hast not been mindful of the rock of thy stronghold. Therefore, you did plant plants of pleasantness and is set with slips of a stranger. And that in Hebrew is an adulterous affair. So you can go out there all you want and you can heap up, as the Bible says, these teachers that have itching ears. They can tickle your ears and make you feel all good inside about every evil that our nation is doing. And not just Israel, I'm talking about the United States as well. Because why? We're not mindful of the rock of our salvation. And so therefore, we're doing these kind of evils in the Middle East. And you're killing your brothers as you go. 
Isaiah 9, as I brought it out as well in the latter part of Isaiah 9, Ephraim devouring the arm of Manasseh, Manasseh Ephraim. That's the Russians and the Americans and the British Empire all fighting against one another. Well, in the end, you're going to turn against Judah as well. I don't know. I don't know what's going to cause it, but I can tell you this much. According to, to Micah chapter 4, the tower the, of the flock, uh, the Migdal Eder of Israel, the leaders of Israel bring the calamity upon the remnant of Israel. All right? So some of the bad mistakes that are being made. I, and, and, and as I brought up the other day about Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's son, I realized the man is an adult. He's the one that's got to be responsible for his actions. And I know that Prime Minister Netanyahu cannot make his son do what he wants him to do. But I can tell you one thing. It speaks of the spirit of the political agenda of the nation like it was in the case of Ahab and Jezebel. The government married into the prostitute Rome once again and brought idolatry back into Israel. His son is only exposing the nature of the government. It speaks nothing about the Jewish people that are there longing for the coming of the Mashiach, praying earnestly for the coming of the Messiah. While Prime Minister Netanyahu's son is out there trying to buy a prostitute. You know what though? Is it any different than when the political leaders run down there and marry into Rome? Prostitute. See? That's what the church has become. All right, and I know this is not easy for me to just say it, I, and I need to spend more time doing some serious study about this so you can really understand where I'm going with this. All right, but we are dealing with a serious situation. We're dealing with prophecy right here on the, on, on the, on the edge of our seats here. And let me tell you something. Speaking about prophecy here, I, I want to share something with you before we move on here. Let's see where it's at here. This one right here. Chinese authorities blow up a Christian mega church with dynamite. All right? I don't even know if they show the picture on here anymore. They, yeah, they don't, they don't want you to see the picture. Let me try so I can bring it up again here. I got this from a good friend of mine, and I cannot call his name. But he keeps me up to date, and as I shared with you, there are those Chinese people that are living in China that are trying to feed and trying to understand the prophetic insights, and they're coming to Israeli News Live to do that. And as he said here, when the church was destroyed, he said about 10,000 people, a legal church, but the Chinese were fearful of what was coming of it. He says, well, it's only a blessing. We'll end up having 10,000 home churches instead because they won't give up. And these brothers and sisters here live under such oppression like you could never imagine in your life. All right? And we're trying to find someone to help us trans transcribe, not every news broadcast we do, but especially in, like in this case here, the prophetic insights, because they are reading them. So we can get them up on Israeli News Live. Friends, listen to me. Let's move on. We looked at Micah 7 there. I want to show you what else, you know, just to show you, as I was saying a, a few minutes ago there, the same situation that's happening as we see in the, the prophecy of Daniel 11 verse 40, going over through there through the Middle East and, and just destroying everything, especially Syria or Assyria, which includes part of Iraq as well. Uh, that even includes Lebanon. So Lebanon's on the chopping block, as we know from General Wesley Clark there. But look here, Erdogan, we will strangle U.S.-backed forces in Syria before it's even born. So the fight in Syria is far from being over. And, you know, at one time, they were having good relationships with the U.S. But that, is, uh, as it says here, Turkey's Tiep Erdogan threatened on Monday to strangle a planned 30,000 strong U.S. backed force in Syria before it's even born, as Washington backing for Kurdish fighters drove a wedge into relations with one of its main Middle East allies. And it's a difficult situation, friends. You know, I mean, the Kurdish people, they're good people. But at the same time, our country is trying to create a state within a state and not honoring 
the fact that Syria is a sovereign nation. I support the idea, especially when the Kurdish people were trying to take northern Iraq and declare that their own uh, land because this is where the Kurds are really from. But instead they're going to make a new Kurdish state, only creating a greater tension in the region. And as Israel says about like Hawaii, that threat becomes more and more every day real. What will happen next? Will Iran get a nuclear weapon or all, is all this just being done in order to justify an attack on Iran? And believe me, I definitely don't agree with Iran and Iran's politics, uh, you know, and forcing their people to live under the bondage of one religion, etc. You know, freedom has completely gone out the window. The Kurds at least have freedom. You know, the women are free to, free to, to, to be human beings. Alright, now... Also, as we brought out uh, yesterday too, uh, Lorenzo on already happened, showing that massive troop movement of the Turkish government headed to the Syrian border. It's not like the U.S. cannot take down the Turkish military, but you know, I had one friend of mine who worked for special forces, U.S. military, and one time we were discussing about that Turkey and Israel and the threat that Israel was facing with Turkey. This has been several years back when it was a, really a big threat for Israel. And he said to me then, he said, Turkey has a military that is very powerful. And he told me he had trained with Turkish military. He said, it would be very difficult for Israel to defeat Turkey. And I've always, that's always stuck in my mind. And I realized are we getting ourselves into a situation where we're going to end up having to fight Turkey as well? You know, I'm all, I, I don't know. You know, because that's the one sticking point with Turkey when it comes to the U.S. They're allies, there's no doubt about it. But when it comes to the Kurds, and this is why Obama and even President Trump never really sided with the Kurds in the past. The only reason they're siding with the Kurds now is to be able to take out Bashar al-Assad and to finish the job in Syria. Again, contrary to God's word of what they should do. And I'm still, even though I know President Putin says that Turkey had nothing to do with the attack on his base there inside of Syria. I still though do not trust Erdogan. But you know, what is President Putin doing it for? He's trying to keep the coalition with Turkey intact because of Syria, and also because of the growing threat of what's going to happen with North Korea. If they don't keep the coalition together, if Turkey goes back with the NATO, which they are a NATO member, they're obligated as a NATO member to defend NATO. So in the event that there is a war between the United States and Russia or the United States and, and China or any of the other allies, NATO, etc., that gets involved in a war there, Turkey is obligated to come to their aid. But Putin is trying to keep the alliance. Can he trust Erdogan? I personally don't think so. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong, and I realize I could be wrong. But I really don't think so. All right, friends, one last thing I want to share with you that very troubling came out on the Jerusalem Post here. A court calls a synagogue torching an act of criticize, to criticize Israel. When I saw this, I could not believe my eyes. A German court calls a synagogue torching an act to criticize Israel. What is this, crystal knock all over again? Are we seeing the rise of Nazism in Germany once again as we're seeing what's going on over uh, there in Ukraine? Do you guys know what the SS really stands for? These are soldiers for the Holy See. Look it up. I think it might shock you. You know, friends, we're dealing with a serious issue. And you know, I made that comment to you guys not long ago. I really believe, especially when Yeshua made the comment, when he says in, 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 in the Word of God, in Matthew 24, when you go further down, around verse 35 or so, and he says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And he speaks about them give, being given and given in marriage, the forced marriages, the eating the flesh, and the drinking blood. And I talked to you about the Nephilim. 
and how I believe that the return of the Nephilim is even in this day. Well, you know what? I was on a broadcast uh, this weekend with John B. Wells on um, Caravan to Midnight. And John, we've been friends for a long time. And it was a very interesting broadcast. And John brought up a scripture just as a reminder, because we went into this issue about the Nephilim. And he brought up the scripture from the book of Jude. And I was really impressed with the scripture that he brought up. But then I went back and I began to really start looking at Jude's words. I want to share just a little bit with you here, all right? It's only one chapter long, like the book of Obadiah. But I want you to look at what Jude says here. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now watch closely. John read it because he speaks about the fallen angels that did not keep their first estate. But I want you to really watch closely. And if you go into the Greek language, this gets very interesting. For there are, there, no, here it is, verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, friends, <laughs> look what he says. And look at the translation in the Greek language. For there are certain men, they crept in undetected, who were before of old and times past, ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They're coming into the church. Could, ordained to this condemnation. Watch. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. All right? They destroyed them that, that, that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Do you notice how Jude is connecting these men that come in and aware, con condemned of times of old, but he's connecting them to the fallen angels. I think he's talking about Nephilim. I think that these men that were before of old ordained to this condemnation, there's only one group of men that were of old times ordained to condemnation, and that was the Nephilim, the children of the fallen angels. And now they're in the church. They're in the governments. Yeshua said that it would repeat what it was then. Okay? Watch what else he says. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to what? Fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Friends, this is all about Nephilim and showing the different time periods throughout biblical history that they, they were existing in among the children of Israel, in among the believers of the time of Yeshua, or after his departing, I should say. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Hmm. Interesting. Defile the flesh once again. Yet Michael the archangel would continue with the devil. He disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally are brute beasts. In those things, they corrupt themselves. Friends, I can't say for sure. I'm just saying it as a conjecture. When I read this, I went back after John read it because I was listening to him read it on Caravan to Midnight. We were on there this past, uh, was it Friday night? It really caught my attention. 
I didn't know if John even noticed the words that he was saying there as he was reading this. But when I heard him read it, verse 4 specifically, and as I brought out in the teaching I did not too long ago, the Nephilim, I believe, have returned in this day. Why else would Christians war against Christians? Why would we allow the church to be destroyed in, East, in, in, in Syria? Why would the Pope of Rome, when Syrian refugees were trying to flee the country, leave the Christians behind, when he had the opportunity to bring them back to Rome? If the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, friends. Pray. S truly seek the Father. Seek, as it says here and here, you know, as, as, as what does he say here? Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you to the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Friends, I can't encourage you enough. We are on the threshold of prophecy. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live, Erev Tov.